Hallelujah. I'm not always one to preach messages based upon the season that we're in sometimes, but, uh, but the other night I, I got up and I was wanting to read, and I thought, well, I mean, why don't I just read about the birth of Christ? Because it's kind of the Christmas season. So I did. started reading that, and I wanted to share some insights from that. Uh, so we'll just go to Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter number 1. And let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be able to look into your word and to be able to share, Lord, uh, what you want to teach us this morning, what we want to ga- ga- gather and uh, gain the knowledge of through your word. We, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're the author and also the one that helps us to understand uh, the message in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. So Matthew chapter number 1, and we'll start with verse number 18. Matthew 1, 18. And you know, if you're, if you're reading the, if you, if you were to read this story about the birth of Christ, we find in the, in the scriptures that there's two places. You can, you can read it in Matthew, and you can also read it in Luke. Luke's a little more detailed in some of the areas, especially even leading up to it. But we'll just, we'll just take the text from Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed, to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Okay, let's just stop there. Okay, let's go back to verse, verse 18. We find that this couple, this young couple, Mary, more than likely a teenager, Joseph, and it said that they were betrothed, that word. And that word means they were engaged, but more than like our type of engagement, it was more of a commitment. There was actually, they actually entered into a legal contract. Okay, this is the way they would do it in Israel. Okay, for for a Jewish custom. They actually met together and signed a contract called a ketubah. So they entered into a, I mean, this in, in Jewish culture was pretty much considered marriage. They hadn't got to the formal ceremony yet, but they were pretty much, you know, committed to one another at this point. The same way we would be in a marriage contract. So it was pretty uh, serious. It said that before they came together, that means before they actually entered into intimacy or a sexual you know, relationship, she, already had, she was already pregnant. Now you have to try to understand, because I was trying to you know, go in my mind and try to picture this, this young couple together, falling in love, making plans, having dreams, having, you know, what, where they're going to, where they're going to live, what they're going to do. We find out that Joseph had a particular skill. Uh, that particular skill, we're told that he was a carpenter. That's a very broad term, actually, the, the Greek word for that. Could mean, could mean that he actually worked with wood, but it also could mean that he was a stonemason. Could mean that he was a blacksmith. Might have worked with metal, might have worked with wood, might have worked with stone, might have worked with all of them. Main thing is he did things, that would, he, he would construct things. Um, I know when I was growing up, you know, we had a lot of different, we had tree houses and all kinds of things. My dad was a carpenter and he built a lot of things. And uh, he worked where he put together, um, he built wood forms that, uh, where they poured, they used to pour cement and, uh, and make mining shafts and things like that. And my dad would build the forms for those. When I uh, got older, my dad told me that when I was a young child, that I always made sure that I told people that, I, that my dad was a carpenter. And I always then came back and said, Jesus' dad was a carpenter. So whenever, whenever you know, I would tell my friends or my teachers or different people, I always let them know, my dad's a carpenter. Jesus' dad was a carpenter. And dad said, I wasn't sure if you were referring more to me being like Jesus' dad or to you being like Jesus. 
why you made those comments. But anyway, I guess that's what I did as a young boy. So, Jesus' dad was a carpenter, and uh, so he, they were raised in Nazareth, in the city of, or the town of Nazareth. Kind of everybody kind of knows everybody. I mean, it's not like you, you didn't spend a lot of time in your home uh, at that time. I mean, you didn't have television or things like that. So most of your activities, your social activities, took place out of the home in the marketplace. And everybody would have known this couple. Um, they were well known. And so all of a sudden, we know this angel comes to Mary. And she said, and he says, you've been chosen. She's like, what are you talking about? Can you imagine this? You've been chosen. You're, you're, going to, you're going to become pregnant, and you're going to have a child that's going to be the Savior of the world. Now, of course, we know this story from, you know, but this is coming to somebody. Can you imagine this is the first time coming? I mean, nobody ever heard of anything like this. Nobody expected this. Nobody knew this was happening. And I mean, you know, what's going through her mind at this time? And she, oh, her first question is, that's impossible. That can't happen because um, I've never been with a man. I said, no, it's gonna, all things are possible with God, and what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and impregnate you. Now, Mary, being a, a righteous, godly woman, said, okay. That's what she said, basically. She said, be it unto me according to your word. If that's your plan for me, I accept it. I accept your plan. I accept all the consequences that's going to come from that. How do you know? How many you know? One, once something like that happens, your entire life has changed. I mean, you, you got your plans. You got your dreams. You got, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to live here. We're going to build this business up. We're, you know, maybe talk about how many children. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're pregnant right now. You're not even married and you're pregnant. How many know things change? Quickly. Children bring a different aspect into a relationship. They're going to bring in more responsibilities. They're going to bring in more problems. I mean, think about even God. You know, God was, everything was going great with God. No, no problems. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden He said, hey, let's have some kids. <laughs> Won't that be fun? I'm going to create man so that, you know, we can just enjoy one another's company and things. How many know that caused a lot of, a lot of issues once he did that, you know what I mean? But how many know, in spite of all that, it was worth it? How many know that if God had to do it all over again, he'd say, you know, I'd still do it again. Even though they cause me a lot of grief sometimes, even though they do things that they never listen half the time, they, you know, they don't obey me a lot of times, they get in all kinds of problems, but you know what? It's still worth it, isn't it? You talk to most parents, and they're going to say, you know, it's, it's worth it. All that aggravation and frustration and everything, just to have those, those times when they come back and show some respect and show some love, it's worth it. And so... You know, the, the issue with Mary and Joseph was they understood that an angel appeared to them. They knew what was going on. But how many know the community didn't quite get that? You know what I'm saying? So, Joseph now, he finds out. Now, can you imagine this conversation? Okay, can you imagine her coming to him and saying, there's something I need to explain to you. You know, I don't even know how, how would you start. You know, I'm pregnant. Well, he knows he's not the father, see? He starts thinking about his buddies and his, you know, the neighbors and, you know, who, who, who was it? And she's like, well, it wasn't anybody, you see, because I've still not been with a man. It was, it was by God. Now, he's, at this point, Joseph's a good guy. He's a pretty good man. Now he doesn't want now he could legally he could shame her. Cuz everybody's going to know, see something's up. He could publicly disgrace her. He could publicly have her executed legally. Okay, for this act. But he's like, "You know what? I I don't want to do that. I I really love this girl. I'm disappointed now. 
my whole dreams are, are, are shot. You know, the things I had planned, everything now, this girl somehow, she has been unfaithful to me. But I still love her, and I don't want to see her go through any more pain than what she's going to go through anyway. So it said that he, in his mind, it said he was mindful, that he decided, I'm just going to do this secretly. We're going we're gonna to annul the whole relationship. You know, we're going to cancel that. And it's basically, it, it's like a divorce. Okay? He's like, we're going we're to go through this divorce. We'll go through all the legal proceedings of what we have to do to get this thing annulled and everything like that. And he said, but I won't, public, I, I won't be the one to publicly disgrace this woman. That's how, that's how thoughtful he was. But while he was considering these things, God sends an angel to him. He said, Joseph, listen. The thing that happened with Mary was the truth. She was telling you the truth. It is of God. He said, don't be afraid. Go ahead and take her to be your wife. She's not been unfaithful to you. So he said, okay. So now he's going to do this. And you understand that she spent some... They were there in Nazareth for at least three, four months after this took place. She, she traveled and spent some time with her relative Elizabeth. You remember all this? Remember Elizabeth? Was, she, was, she had become pregnant and she was uh, barren, but God opened up her womb and she was, she had, uh, she was pregnant with... You know, I don't know who she was pregnant with? John the Baptist, okay? And so who was a relative of Jesus. So she, she went and spent three months with Elizabeth, then came back. So there she is. And, you know, at this point, you know, some people might think that she had, you know, she started, you know, maybe eating a lot more. Who knows what? You know, because starting, st- things are starting to show, okay? Things are starting to show in Nazareth to a young unmarried couple and gossip and rumors started to fly I can imagine but the governor sends out this decree and he says you know what we're gonna have to do we're going to issue that everybody has to get registered the census and uh, and that's gonna require everybody to go back to their hometown now Joseph had a hometown you know where it was Bethlehem that's where he was from so even though they were living in Nazareth, that's 65 miles away, they were going to have to go there. That's not a convenient thing. And so here they are having to travel 65 miles while she's pregnant. Now, she's pretty pregnant by the time they left. Probably in the, you know, eight, eight, eight and a half months maybe type of pregnancy, maybe nine, right in that area. So they're departing from Nazareth to head to Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? It's house of bread. The house of bread. And so that's where they were going back. So they were going back into Bethlehem, and when they got there, it probably took a little longer than most people to get there. And so by the time they got there, there wasn't any place for them to stay. Now, it wasn't like they had a bunch of hotels out there or anything. Okay? Jeff Bodet hadn't been there. He wasn't leaving the light on. There wasn't, there, those things weren't there. Okay, so just basically kind of hanging out in people's homes. That was, that was the inn, by the way. Somebody's home, somebody's upper room or something like that. But they were filled because re- everybody was coming in there. All the, in a, and, and Mary and Joseph were a little slower getting there, you know, because she was pregnant and it took longer to get there. And uh, so they had to go. It said they, they were able to go and stay in this place and, and she was able to give birth and, and took him and laid him in a manger, which is really interesting. Okay, really interesting to lay them in a manger when you think about it. But manger is really like a feeding trough. But it worked out comfortably for them. It would would actually be just as comfortable as a crib would be today, you know. And so what this manger, what they would do with these mangers is we know that right outside of Bethlehem was the fields where the shepherds were, where they were keeping sheep. Now this is, Bethlehem is really close in proximity to Jerusalem. So these sheep more than likely were being raised for a particular event. You understand? A lot of these sheep that were in the hills of Bethlehem were going to be the same sheep that people would use on Atonement Day in Jerusalem. Just a couple miles away. They would, have to get a, they would have to get a lamb and they would have to take that lamb 
on Atonement Day or on Passover, and they would have to have that lamb killed. Now, the problem with that is those lambs had to be perfect. They had to be perfect. They had to be without spot. They had to be without blemish. They had to be, you know, no bruises, no cuts, no anything. They had to be perfect lambs to, in order to use them as the sacrifice. And so what would happen is when the lambs were about to give birth, or the, or the sheep were about to give birth to their little lambs, the shepherds would take these lambs. Now watch this. They would take these lambs, and the ones that came out that were perfect, they wanted to keep them perfect, so they would wrap them up in cloths and lay them in mangers for a little while to protect them so they wouldn't bump and bang in each other and cause any kind of you know, blemishes. And so, in order, and so for the first few days or weeks or whatever it was, they would actually take these little lambs and wrap them up in cloths and lay them in the mangers to protect them. And so here comes Jesus as the Lamb of God that was going to be our perfect sacrifice. And here the sign, it said, was going to be He was going to be wrapped like a lamb in a cloth and laid in a manger like the lamb to prepare for sacrifice. Now the lambs were going to be sacrificed fairly immediately. Jesus was going to be sacrificed about 33 years later. But still the symbolism was all there. So I look at the events and it's just kind of, you know, I go through my mind trying to figure all this out. Now you realize once they got, once they got into Bethlehem and gave birth to Jesus, they didn't go back to Nazareth. They didn't just come down there, register at the census, have the baby and say, okay, now we're going home. They didn't go home. I wonder why. I wonder what it was like there before they left. I wonder what it was like while Mary was eight, nine months pregnant and they're not married. And I wonder what was, what, why they didn't go back there. They stayed, in, they stayed in Bethlehem. They just made a home there. And they stayed there for two years. Do you know that the wise men weren't at the manger? Do you know the wise men were not there the night that Jesus was born? Do you know according to the Scripture that they didn't come till much later? It said that when, by the time they got there, they had seen, it said they saw a star in the sky and they show up in Jerusalem. They didn't go to Bethlehem, they went to Jerusalem. And they wanted to inquire. They said, something's going on. We, we, we sensed something. We seen this star that took place. We gathered our whole entourage and all this. And, uh, and now here we are, and we're in Jerusalem. And, we're, and it said, there, where's, this, where's this baby at? There, there's something happened. We're, we're sure of it. There's a, a king that's been born. And Herod is like, what? I mean, he's the king, see? They went to Herod. Because they figured that's where, you know, he's the king, so he ought to know, who, you know who's been born king. They, they might have thought it was Herod's son. Anyway, they would go to Herod, and it said that Herod inquired, and he, he, he calls all the religious people up, the scribes and different people, and he said, what, what's going on? Is there supposed to be a king born? Where's he supposed to be born? And they said, oh yeah, yeah, the, the scripture says that, he, that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Herod goes, huh. And so now these wise men are coming from the east and they're saying, yeah, he's already been born. We saw the star. And Herod goes, hmm. So now he's thinking, see, because a lot of times in that culture, as soon as a, a king was called or born, oftentimes a young child would take over as king at a very early age. And so Herod was afraid of his life. So he tells these men, he said, I want you to go in there to Bethlehem and you find him. And then you come back here and tell me because I want to go worship him too. Of course, he didn't want to go worship him. He wanted to kill him. But he said, just let me know who he is so I can get in there and I can worship him too. He tells the wise men this. Now, the wise men, I know that tradition kind of tells us that there were three of them, but uh, that does not appear to be the case in Scripture because it said that they came from on a long journey and it said when they got into Jerusalem inquiring about this, uh, this Savior, it said that the entire city was in an uproar because this had to be a large group of people, possibly, possibly a hundred of them. Okay? There was a number of, uh, of, of magi or kings or astrologers, whatever they were, but they were carrying gifts. We know the gifts. They were, they were bringing gold and frankincense and myrrh. These were uh, expensive things. 
they were bringing them by camels, so there had to be camels. When you're traveling that kind of distance, you're not traveling by yourself. You've got to have protection. So they probably had soldiers of some sort or guards or whatever, and there had to be a good group of people that come through Jerusalem to cause the whole city to be in an uproar. The tradition says three, and the reason the tradition says three uh, was because they knew that whenever churches were going to do skits later on, it was going to be a lot easier to have just, you know, just find three guys that can you know, play that. Because there was going to be three, you know, and the three came because there were three gifts. So that made it kind of easy. Each one would have a, you know, each king can come up and play a gift, and then we can have thousands of years of, of depictions of Christmas. So that's where that tradition came from. But nowhere does it ever say there was three. We just know there was lots of them. Okay? How many, we don't know. But there had to be a good many to cause an uproar. Anyway, it said when they got there, by the time they got to Bethlehem, you know that Jesus was no longer a baby. He said he was a toddler. He was a young child, actually, it says in Matthew chapter 2. It said he was a young child, and they didn't come to the manger. It said it came to the house. Mary and Joseph already had been there a couple years. Okay? Jesus had already, you know, he already, he's now about two years old. And that's when they came. They came to the house about two years later. And that's when they presented all the gifts to them. All right? Now, they get warned in a dream. So God sends an angel to them and says, Now listen, don't go back to that guy, that Herod. Don't go back that way. So it said they left another way to go home. Now Herod finds out he's been tricked. Do you know what Herod does? He said, that, Okay, they're not going to come back tell me who he is. I know where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. No problem, I'll take care of the whole thing. You know, could you imagine, can you imagine a, a, a person's heart so evil that he said, just to make sure that I get this guy, I send all my soldiers into Bethlehem and command them to kill every male child two years old and younger. Everyone. Can you imagine that? And that's what he did. Sent them in to kill every male child in, in Bethlehem. But Jesus wasn't there because God spoke to Joseph and said, I want you to get up and I want you to get out of there and take that child down to Egypt. Because the man, Herod, trying to kill him. So Joseph does that. He gets up, him and Mary, they get out of there and they they flee down to Egypt. And they flee down to Egypt for a number of years. We're not sure how long. Maybe five years, we'll say, somewhere in there, give or take a few. They go down to Egypt, and finally the angel said, okay, Herod Herod dies, and he said, the guy that was trying to kill him is dead. Nobody's after the child any longer. You can come back into Israel. He comes back into Israel. He goes to settle in a couple places, and finally he settles. You know where he settles? Back in Nazareth. The place where they, how many know, went full circle. The place where they were, the place where they had it figured out, the place where they were going to raise a family, they thought now their whole plans have been rejected by God, and God gave them a whole new thing, but didn't realize that God was bringing them right back around, right back where they can start that business back up again, right back, probably moved into the same place where they thought they were going to get in the first place, went ahead and raised a family. How many know Jesus wasn't the only child? How many know that Jesus had a number of brothers and sisters and things, and Mary and Joseph had plenty of children, and he had a nice business going, and, and they got to fulfill their dream even after they were able to do God's plan. You see? Because a lot of times what happens in our lives is when God comes and speaks to us, we reject it, and we say we're not going to do it because we already got our plans. We already got our idea what we're going to do. And so we reject God and say we're not going to do it because we got our own plans. But how many know when you fulfill God's plan, God takes you even into a higher level. He takes you, he he fulfills your plans above and beyond what you could ask or imagine. Because when they left Nazareth, I'm sure they thought they were never going back. We're done with this place. But God restored it. How many know, how many's had some relationships sometimes you thought, I'm done with them? Never to talk to that person. And then later on, God brings them back into your life again. You know, later on, or you leave a particular area and say, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going back there. But then later on in life, God brings you back around. And here we are doing the same thing again. And the very thing that I thought that I'd never do, I'm back again doing what I love to do. Amen? I know Tammy and I, we had plans. You know, we were engaged. We, we had plans of what we were going to... Hey, pastoring a church was not in those plans. That was not... 
That was not part of what Tim and I discussed. That wasn't part of what we planned on doing. Uh, but, you know, and, and we never thought we'd be in Indiana. That was, a, that was the last place we thought we'd be. And so here we are in Indiana. Here we are fulfilling our dreams and desires. Uh, a house full of cats, you know, just like we planned. And <laughs> just, you know, raising those up and, and things. So here we are, you know, fulfilling those dreams and desires again, just like, you know, uh, we had planned from the beginning. So, you know, God, God just has a way of restoring, of bringing restoration and all that back to us, you know, whenever we yield ourselves to God. And, and in other words, it's like, well, I had these plans, but then this happened. How I many no plans change? I had these plans, and now I'm pregnant. Well, praise God. Now embrace that plan and see what God does with that. Well, I had these plans, and now, now, now I lost my job. Okay. Well, just trust God and see what God has. To, you know, see what, ha- see what let, allow God to restore. Okay? So, so you can make your plan. How many know it says, in, I think it's in Proverbs, we read this, uh, that, that the man has all, all kind of plans, but God's the one that orders the steps. You know, we have all these ideas of what we're going to do, but then as we yield ourselves to God, he, you know, we give him permission to change those things. How many really give him permission to change those things? You know, uh, you know we, have the, we have those things. So here I am, you know, I'm in college. And I got plans. I want to. I want to work for the CIA. You know, I, I have plans where I'm going to uh, do some investigation, work top secret stuff, do this kind of you know this kind of stuff. And so I end up. Long story short, I get a job at the Pentagon. Okay, uh, for the Defense Intelligence Agency. So I have this. I have some connections and I end up getting this job and I end up the, the government, uh, uh, the United States government does a security clearance, uh, they run a security clearance test on me because I'd be working with top secret material and things like that in the Defense Intelligence Agency. And so this goes on, what year was that? 1988, 1988. And so here I am, uh, they're going through this kind of stuff and, um, and, and it, takes, uh, it takes months for them to go through that. And at that time I end up selling out to God, okay? Basically gave my heart to God uh, fully and trusting Him. So the plans that I had to work in the Pentagon for the Defense Intelligence Agency, they weren't quite as up there now that I sold out to God, see? So what happened was once the job became available, I felt by the Spirit of God that I wasn't to go. So I didn't go. I stayed here. Stayed in, stayed in little Indiana, Pennsylvania. Could have been in the Pentagon, but I didn't go. I didn't take the, the, the job with the federal government, turned them down, and I stayed here. I, I feel that if I would have taken the job at the Pentagon, that Tammy and I probably would not be together Okay, at that time. We had just started dating, and, and that, our relationship at that time, early on, probably would not have survived the long distance like that type of thing at that point. So, but I just felt that God you know, wanted me to stay, so I stayed. Now, I didn't stay because I had a great job. Uh, that's not why I stayed. So I turned down a job with the federal government working in the Pentagon. I turn that job down and I'm working at a local tire factory and I'm not even working for the company. I'm working for a manpower organization and I'm making minimum wage with no benefits. $4.25 an hour is what I'm making and I'm loading tires on the trucks. That's what I'm doing. I'm in a warehouse. Loading tires on the trucks, two college degrees, <laughs> job at the Pentagon waiting on me, and I'm loading tires in the trucks, and I'm the happiest guy in the world. Completely contented because I knew that God wanted me to stay here. Didn't know why, didn't know what was going on. I just made that decision, and I had total peace. Total peace. And God began to work things out. Didn't work it out right away, but started to work things out. A few months later, started, started work. I never thought I'd stay at the tire factory. I didn't think that's where I was going to stay. But the next thing I know, people were approaching me at the tire factory. Hey, would you like this job? Would you like that job? And next thing I know, I ended up with a pretty good job. I, worked, I started working in the engineering, in the industrial engineering department. And so I started to get, I, I got a, a pretty good job at, at the tire factory. And then by then, you know, Tammy and I got engaged. And then we got married. 
And, uh, and, and so things started to go pretty good. Things started to open up here in Indiana. We, didn't, we still didn't realize we were going to do a church or anything like that. That was not on the, on the agenda at all. But see, how many know God started bringing things back around? And you started to think, well, what if you would have went? What if you would have went and took that job at the Pentagon? I mean, what? I mean, think about that. Think about the, the opportunities. You'd be doing what you love to do. You'd be working with the Defense Intelligence Agency and, and, and working on top secret stuff and working out of the Pentagon and kind of, you know, got kind of set. Federal government, kind of nice benefits, all that kind of stuff. Well, see, that would have been great. And that would have probably gone pretty good for a little while. Except for one problem. September 11, 2001. There was a plane crash into the Pentagon that morning. How many remember? How many remember? Hit the World Trade Towers, but it also one hit the Pentagon. Monday morning. Right into the offices of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Over 240 people killed that morning in those offices. So I might have ended up taking a fantastic job. Might have ended up fulfilling my dreams. Doing what it... I love to do and tell them God, nah, I know better. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to fulfill my life the way I want to do it, doing my career. I'm going to stay here at some dumb old tire factory and do things where I'm not getting paid like I think I should be or when I, you know, not get to do what I want to do, not make the money I want to make, not have the dreams I have. I'm going to go do it my way. I mean, no, that might not last it too long. It might last it for a while. It might last it for a while. But see, that's why it's important that you, it's okay to have dreams. It's okay to have those kind of things. It's okay to follow them. But when God intervenes, make sure when God intervenes, you, you say yes to God. Amen? Because God knows better. He knows what's best. He's got, your, he's got a plan for you that's better than your plan. See, what happens is, we think our plan's better than God. That's just the way we think sometimes. We just think, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to listen to God. I already got these plans. I know what I want to do. I mean, you know, yielding to God, God, God loves you so much. You know, God loved... Can you imagine how much God loved Mary and Joseph? And yet allowed them to go through misunderstanding like that. I mean, he, he had to know that was going to hurt them. He had to know these godly, righteous people were going to be ashamed. They were going to feel like people, they were going to be disappointed. They were going to feel, you know, people are talking about us. People, we, we're trying to explain to people that this is God and they're laughing at us. We're trying to tell them, you know, was she, yeah, no, she really is a virgin. <laughs> yeah, how much you've been drinking, you know. Now, you understand? And God let them go through that. That had to be hurtful. They're, you know, trying to even convince their own family. Would have been tough. And he let them go through that for a time. But then he brought them out and brought them right back around full circle. Honored them, blessed them. And see, sometimes we, we miss out on the bigger picture because we look at the temporary situation and we don't like that temporary situation. And sometimes we make decisions based upon a temporary situation. You know, could you imagine me making a decision to go to, to, to the Pentagon just because I'm, I'm only making four twenty five an hour, I got no benefits, I got an education, what am I doing throwing tires on the trucks for? I could be doing better than this. But because God said stay, I have to make a decision based on what God said, not because my temporary situation doesn't fit my plan. You understand? But God knows. And when you trust God, even though you go through a temporary time period of un uncomfortableness, maybe some pain, disappointment, you stay true to God, God will bring that around full circle and bring blessing through it and bring fulfillment through that. 
and allow His plans and purposes to be developed in your life. Because you trusted Him. You trusted Him even when things... See, God wants to know that you're going to trust Him even when things don't look good. He wants to know that. He doesn't want you just to serve Him just because, well, I'll just serve God because no matter any time I get in any kind of trouble or anything, He's going to bail me out. He's going to just take care of me. He's going to, and He does take care of us. But He wants you to serve Him even whenever He tells you to do something that's kind of maybe going to cause a little bit of pain. Maybe going to cause a little bit of misunderstanding. Maybe not look so good right away. But He says, will you still trust me? Because my ultimate plan is going to bless you. But you've got to hang on to this. Amen? Amen. Let's stand our feet. I didn't get through that chapter very much, did I? Okay. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you. I thank you, Lord, that you give us dreams and visions. I thank you, Lord, that you put desires in our heart. I thank you, Lord, that we take our plans, our dreams, and we give them to you. And we allow you to redirect if need be. Put them on hold if need be. But the main thing is that we're following you. We're listening to you and we're allowing you to lead us in our lives and direct our steps in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you all.